Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like Joseph793. Thanks, Joe. Tonight, Rucci cooks some gears, Callum hits a sprocket, and I terrorize a local beach. As some of you know, I did a master's degree in spacecraft engineering at the University of Southampton, which is why that Kerbal esports event was a bit like throwing some green belt judo kids into the ring with a heavyweight boxer. As part of that degree though, I had to write two dissertations. The first individual one about Venus microprobe is a story for another day, but the second one was a group design project that got the highest mark in our year and won two of the five available awards at the engineering faculty's design show. I spent so much time on that animation for our project video, I wasn't going to miss an opportunity to reuse it. Credit for the concept of a clockwork rover goes to Dr. Jonathan Sorda from NASA JPL, who released a report investigating a mission he titled ARI. The surface of Venus is one of the most hostile environments in the solar system, with pressures equivalent to a kilometre under the ocean and temperatures hot enough to melt lead. That last fact is such an overused comparison in Venus literature that it became a bit of a meme during our project. Previous spacecraft to visit the surface succumbing to the elements in a matter of minutes, it was shown that the use of conventional electronics for any long-term exploration was impossible. Therefore, Dr. Sorda proposed a revolutionary idea, not using electronics at all. Mechanical computers can be assembled with temperature and corrosion resistant materials such as titanium, allowing a spacecraft to survive on Venus's surface far longer than the 127 minute record set by the Soviet Venera 14 probe. And analog mechanical computers are nothing to scoff at. Soviet crewed spacecraft relied on one named Globus for orbital navigation until 2002. In fact, they can be significantly faster and more efficient than digital. The prevalence of digital computers today is simply due to their flexibility. You can download a new program and add functionality to a digital computer, whereas a mechanical one is limited to the purpose it was built for. But remember that such devices crack the Enigma code. Some rudimentary navigation is well within their capabilities. The ARI concept uses the thick Venusian atmosphere to its advantage, powering the rover with a wind turbine. This is where another advantage of a mechanical computer presents itself, in that the mechanical power produced by the turbine can be used directly, instead of incurring significant losses converting it into electricity. The RE report was only the first phase of investigation into the novel idea, with a follow-up design named Harvey incorporating some cutting-edge advances in high-temperature electronics. The research is still ongoing though, with Dr. Sorda even sourcing ideas from the public through the NASA Exploring Hell Challenge. It was here that I saw a unique opportunity to research ideas NASA had even thought of. The way final year group design projects work at Southampton Uni is a little weird. You can rank the available ongoing projects in order of preference and then be assigned one with a random group, or you can self-propose a project with a team of your choice. And it's safe to say I didn't want 15% of my degree in the hands of five people I'd never met. I was made aware of the clockwork Venus rover concept by the supervisor of my first dissertation, Dr. Hanna Sikorska-Lawrence, as she ran several projects intended to support such a mission. So I proposed to the team my friend Rucci had assembled that we actually build one. After receiving a green light from Hannah that she was willing to supervise us, we got our proposal in mere hours before the deadline. The immediate first step was to massively reduce the scope of the project. We had justified the need for a rover with a mission profile involving deploying seismometers to learn more about the internal structure of Venus. But with a team of six people, all of whom had several other modules to study for, and a time frame of eight months, there was no way we were going to be able to build a complete rover and accompanying mechanical seismometers. We were also limited by a budget of £850, which was pretty stingy considering we were each paying over nine grand a year for the pleasure of being there. We decided that the novel research area was how the rover would move and avoid obstacles. The method of locomotion would fundamentally constrain the design of the obstacle detection system, and vice versa, so we couldn't design one without the other. We'd then need a mechanical computer and a drivetrain to interface between them. With us settling on these subsystems as the irreducible scope of the project, we divided ourselves into different roles. Alex was our assembly and integration lead, Aria would work on the obstacle detection system, Rucci on the drivetrain, and Callum on the locomotion system. That left Laura and myself to work on the mechanical computer. While we brainstormed a lot of weird and wonderful designs, Rucci reached out to Dr. Sorda to see if he could share any data and allow us to make assumptions regarding the subsystems we weren't building, such as how much power the wind turbine would give us to work with. Honestly, we didn't even expect a response from a busy JPL engineer, but Dr. Sorda delivered and then some. As well as an hour-long video call answering our questions, detailing his research and sharing the countless lessons he'd learned, he also provided us with an unpublished draft of his Phase 2 report. He was hugely supportive of our project and even asked us to stay in touch. Dr. Sorda, you're a legend. 
After some extensive research and some heated debates, we eventually settled on a tracked rover with a three triple roller obstacle detection system. We also named it the Venus Analog Land Explorer, which was absolutely just a Pixar reference. According to Dr. Sorda, NASA had ruled out tracks for their rover early on, due to their higher mass and energy requirements than wheels, but we decided to give them a serious look due to some of their key advantages. A trapezoidal track has unparalleled obstacle traversal capability, reducing the necessary resolution of the obstacle detection system to objects longer than half the rover's length or taller than its front drive sprocket. It also facilitated a much simpler mechanical computer, as it merely needed to switch one or both tracks into reverse to carry out maneuvers rather than calculating turn angles for wheels. The three rollers could detect the rough location of any obstacle too steep for the rover to climb, or with the spacing between them being equivalent to half the length of the tracks, any fissure too wide for the rover to cross. The triple rollers on each detection arm would allow them to climb obstacles rather than getting stuck on them. We also added a pressure plate to handle edge cases where an undetected obstacle could impact the chassis. Interpreting the signals from the arms and pressure plate was the mechanical computer. Electronic and or and not logic gates are the foundation of digital computers. Arrange them in just the right way and you get addition, subtraction, multiplication, and eventually ASMR intense ear attention and mouth sounds, tick 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 clicking. Shoo. You can build mechanical equivalents of all of these logic gates though. While not microscopic like their electronic counterparts, they work in exactly the same way. Laura got stuck into building prototypes while I used Simulink to design the circuit that would connect them. Through prototyping and numerical optimization, Laura discovered that 15 millimeters was the minimum displacement needed to avoid cumulative errors propagating through the computer. This constraint actually ended up sizing the entire design. Meanwhile, I ended up with a circuit design that could take any possible combination of the seven inputs and decide whether the rover needed to turn left or right to avoid an obstacle. During this time, Alex made us all aware of the Simulink Student Challenge, a competition that you could enter with a short video about any project that involved Simulink in any way. Although my usage of it wasn't particularly advanced, we had to make a video for our project anyway, for which I'd already started many of the animations. It wasn't any extra work, so we entered. Not really expecting to hear anything back. Oh. We came third. In the world. We weren't obligated to invest the prize money into the project, so thanks to MathWorks for funding some wild nights out, I guess. Unfortunately, Callum was encountering some serious problems designing the tracks. Their complex multi-body nature makes simulating them impossible to do by hand. Although software exists to model them, it's extremely expensive and none of the vendors were interested in supporting our project. We could get around the need to simulate with a lot of experimental data, but due to the primary usage of tracks being on military vehicles, all of this data is either classified or so old it isn't digitized. The only place in the UK with archives of the data we needed was the Tank Museum at Bovington. So we went to the Tank Museum at Bovington. Claire Cooper, the education officer at the Tank Museum, was extremely enthusiastic about supporting the project. We got free tours of their workshops that the public usually don't get to see, accompanied by subject matter experts who were all too happy to answer our endless questions about the track, sprocket, and drivetrain designs on display. We spent hours in their archives with their historian Stuart Wheeler, which turned out to be the holy grail of data that we needed. The curator of the museum, David Willey, even came out to give us a guided tour. I won't lie, myself and Callum were pretty starstruck as we're War Thunder nerds who've watched all of his tank chats. As there's no soil analogue for Venus, in fact we don't even know what the surface is made of, Callum decided to design the tracks for the worst possible terrain, loose sand. We saw so many different traction improving patterns, called grousers, at the tank museum that Callum decided to put screw holes into the track linkages, allowing us to test different patterns with a single set of tracks. With our preliminary design and some prototypes complete, we began finalizing our detailed design ready for manufacturing. An immediate problem presented itself at the interface between the mechanical computer and the gearbox route you was designing to allow each track to reverse. The signal from the computer was impulsive. As soon as the rover began reversing, it would revert to neutral and cause the rover to drive forward again, getting stuck in an endless loop. We needed a timing mechanism to convert the signal from the input computer into one of two fixed duration maneuvers, reversing and turning left, or reversing and turning right. I solved this with a device that came to be known as the output computer. The timing was derived from a clutch connected to the drivetrain, which meant the maneuver was coupled to the distance the rover moved rather than a specific time period. The shapes of the two cams that guided the movement of the output rods to the gearboxes would cause the rover to reverse and then turn. With a second output computer with an inverted connection to the gearboxes, the rover could reverse and turn in the opposite direction. You'll notice some Arduino powered stepper motors turning the clutch on our prototypes as we wanted to be able to test different maneuver durations before setting it in stone with whatever gear ratio connected it to the drivetrain. 
Ruchi settled on a planetary gearbox design, consisting of a sun gear, planet gears, and a ring gear. With this design, the computer would only need to apply a brake to the planet gear carrier to engage reverse. Forward motion could then be induced by releasing the carrier and simultaneously driving the sun and planet gears with a torque transmitter. The elegant part is that no clutch or gear shifting is required. With our designs in hand, it was time to begin manufacturing. One small problem, we didn't have anything close to the budget we needed to build everything out of metal. We'd chosen aluminium as it's a reasonable mass simulant for the titanium that would be needed for Venus, and we simply couldn't afford enough of it. Remember, this is aerospace grade aluminium we're talking about. That is, regular sheet aluminium, as most aluminium is suitable for aerospace. Ignore any advert that touts that like it's something special. Although the university ran a Dragon's Den-esque elevator pitch for additional funding, they rejected us for not having a completed prototype of a Venus rover two months in for a three minute elevator pitch. Yeah, it was cost cutting time. Instead of 3D printing the mechanical computer out of metal like we wanted to, it was going to be assembled out of PLA, screws, and laser cut perspex. With all of our allocated workshop time and aluminium we could afford being consumed by the 160 track linkages, the entire gearbox had to be 3D printed out of PLA. Now, you don't need to be an engineer to guess that this wasn't an ideal material for a smoothly operating gearbox. With other projects not even using their manufacturing time, we did attempt to get components made through our friends, but unfortunately the workshop team caught on and weren't particularly impressed. We can't really complain though, the track linkages ended up taking far longer than the hours they quoted, and they never charged us for any of the water jet cutting or welding they did. Truly, we wouldn't have been able to deliver half of what we accomplished without their support. Fortunately, a second elevator pitch opportunity presented itself in the second semester, and after showing the completely different and considerably more enthusiastic panel a screeching plastic gearbox prototype, we got another £300 to buy more aluminium, and at least water jet cut some rods and gears. It wasn't perfect, but it'd have to do. With no budget for bevel gears, we settled on bike chains to transfer torque from the 40 watt motor that simulated the wind turbine. In fact, we scavenged several components from a little girl's bike we found on Facebook Marketplace. We got it for free in exchange for the promise it would go to a good new home, though it being cannibalized for parts on a Venus forever probably wasn't what they had in mind. We lived in the student workshops for the next few weeks. Not only did we need to assemble and test the prototype, but we had to make a presentation, a video, and a 25,000 word group report. Then we each had to write a 5,000 word individual report for good measure. It's safe to say that we barely slept. We also had coursework and exams for other modules to prepare for. I assure you that anyone who says university is just a non-stop party definitely did a philosophy degree. The amount of crunch we were under was pretty plain to see as the combination of four years of engineering degree was a rover bent into shape with a mallet, held together by superglue, sanded with a drill, <laughs> and full of gears temperature fitted by heating them up in a frying pan. Yes, really, the workshops wouldn't let us use their kilns so we had to get creative. Rest in peace oven glove. For anyone that deifies engineering or university research, remember that we were the best our year had to offer. Unfortunately, we just didn't have time to fully integrate our subsystems. Although the gearbox worked when we turned it, it produced so much friction that the motor sheared off a gear instead of moving it. It also required far more force to put into reverse than the computer was capable of producing, even with a force multiplier. In fact, it turned out that integration testing and refinement of the subsystems could have been another 8 month project in itself. We settled for connecting the track sprockets directly to the motor to test the tracks in different terrain. Although the results were promising, with the rover easily able to move and turn on sand, the PLA mount points for the sprockets kept buckling under the strain of tensioning the tracks. We'd wanted to build them out of aluminium, but were once again prohibited by our budget. Something tells me it's not avoiding that obstacle. The bent sprockets kept throwing off the tracks after moving a few meters, but the process took far longer driving in reverse, so that's how we conducted most of our testing. That's what I was thinking. The flexing and friction from the PLA mounting meant a phenomenal amount of force was needed to pass an input through all five layers of the mechanical logic gates. Because of this, we elected to not even spend time connecting it to the obstacle detection system. All in all, it was disheartening that we didn't get a complete integrated prototype working. It would have been incredible to see the rover bump into an obstacle and maneuver around it as designed, but we hadn't failed. All of the problems we encountered were due to our resource constraints, and with the testing we were able to conduct on the subsystems individually, we were able to demonstrate that our concept was sound. Hey, yeah, dug yourself out. It was a research project after all, and we'd laid the groundwork for future teams to take it further which they did. In the years since, a new project team has finished the computer to gearbox interface, built and tested the wind turbine, and even added a communication system. They simplified and reduced the capabilities of my input computer design though, so zero out of 10. Look how they massacred my boy. 
Have you heard of the old mechanical rover? <laughs> we achieved a mark of 84%, the highest of any group design project in the year. We then won not only the Design Excellence Award from the university, but also an award from representatives of Arup, Jaguar Land Rover, Siemens and Shell for the design's adaptation to its unique operating environment. After graduation, we presented our work to Dr. Sorder, who was particularly interested in our mechanical computer and investigation into tracks as a method of locomotion. His only request was that we publish our work to add it to the pool of knowledge that may one day contribute to actually sending the mission to Venus. We're currently working on publishing a scientific article about the project, but if you want to read the report we submitted to the university, 15 minutes before the deadline, I've linked it below. I have to warn you, it's full of a lot of fluff the Mark Scheme demanded regarding our project management and concept selection. But if you're a huge nerd and fancy some light reading going into far more technical detail, it's there if you want it. A massive thanks to Alex, Aria, Laura, Rucci and Callum for being the best teammates anyone could have asked for. Anyone who's done a group project in university or even school knows that a team in which everyone pulls their weight and then some really is exceptionally rare. Thank you to Dr. Hannah Skolska lawrence and Dr. Sean Simon for agreeing to supervise this insanely overambitious passion project. And a huge thank you to Dr. Jonathan Sorda and everyone at the Tank Museum for supporting our research. If anyone is considering a similar project as part of their degree, or better yet, considering continuing our work at Southampton, feel free to get in touch with me. I happen to know there were a few Penguinauts at the uni who were trying to figure out who I was. Let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in a video about my other dissertation, though I'm aware it doesn't quite have the same cool factor as a clockwork rover. We even had academic at the uni tell us they were fans of our project, which I think played a big part in us getting the second elevator pitch grant. Thanks for watching Penguinauts, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. A massive thank you to my patrons for their generous support, and an extra special thank you to the amazing steak, Dakota Clark, Madzor, Peter Lustinet, Simone67, Scott Milligan, Lady Lagsalot, Jesse Smith, NX74656, Olaf Hammerhand, Jordan Millwood, Luna Nicole the Fox, Frosty Moon, Mr. Blue Star, Hendrick, Con of Class, and F22 Raptor.